Almighty God, we pray that the Holy Spirit would fill this place, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the things that you would have us hear and learn and inwardly digest today. Lord, I thank you by your grace that you have made us a family, that you have made us brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that in you um, we can come and be your church. We can be your people, not divided against itself, but unified with a sense of our plenteous redemption that you have wrought for us in Christ Jesus and with a clear mission, even in the midst of all of our afflictions, to be people who bear light into dark places, who tell the truth in a world full of lies. I pray, Father, today that you would allow us to see how desperate is the state of this world absent you, and how beautiful the world is when you are here with us. So Lord, be with us. Open the eyes of our minds and our hearts and our souls today, Lord, to see you as you are, our great Redeemer King. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room and joining us online be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, Lord, as we depend upon you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So two of today's lessons from Scripture are stories full of horror. And I wish that these stories were not true, but they are. And reading them or hearing them read aloud should always be for us a dreadful experience. If they do not fill us with a sense of horror, if we become so familiar with them and so inured to their power that we miss what is being said in them, and then this morning I want to invite you to pay attention. And when we comprehend the depth of the darkness in these stories, it should make us afresh and anew thankful for what God has done for us in Jesus. He has stepped in to take our horror away and replace it, as the collect for today puts it, with a quiet confidence and a godly peace all through the power of his cross. We're also reminded that the world outside, the world out there apart from Jesus, it still lives under the doom of these stories full of horror. And so that world out there is a world that desperately needs to hear through us and to see reflected in our lives the salvation that is ours in Jesus that is offered not just to us, but to the whole world. But let's not leap too quickly to that sense of quiet confidence and godly peace, nor to our mission as God's church. Instead, this morning, I want us to live for just a little while in the horror of these stories, of the dread that they should rightly produce in us. So first, we'll look at Genesis 3. How can we comprehend the seismic disaster of Adam and Eve's disobedience and their, their denial of the lordship of God in their lives. We casually talk about this as the story of the fall. Like you know these first three or four chapters of Genesis so well that you can just blaze through them. You walk through art museum and you see countless beautiful depictions of the story of what happened in the garden. Growing up, my Sunday school teacher would put a little felt apple in a little felt Eve's hand and that was about the story that I received. This story should make us recoil. Because when you wonder about the illness in your life and the death in your family and the chaos in your mind and the brokenness of human relationships, it all finds its origin right here. Because of this first surrender to that temptation, to make our own way in the world, a temptation we all succumb to far more often than we care to admit. We see true horror 
has entered into the world. And it doesn't take much to glance around and see its effects still raging around us. We know the darkness of this world. It is human sin that has led to the world that we know. Nature in chaos. Our bodies wracked with pain and disease. Our human relationships full of turmoil. Our work toil. Our future a return to the dust. We who were made to live forever in the light of the goodness of God are now naked in the light of our sin. And as Paul puts it in Romans 7, who will save us from this body of death? Today's passage from Mark is equally terrifying. In it, we find the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one through whom all things were made and for whom all things were made. God from God, light from light. He comes into the world to his own to redeem them from their sins. And yet the scribes, these men made after God's own image, these men trained in the law of God, they not only resist Jesus' message of redemption and repentance, but they go so far as to declare Jesus to be possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of all of Satan's demons. In response, Jesus declares that to see the work of God and then dismiss it as irrelevant or the work of the devil, it's a blasphemy that leads human beings to hell. This is a story of horror. If you have not seen this encounter between Jesus and the scribes in that light, allow Jesus to put a fine point on it. We tend to read this passage and immediately you're hoping the pastor will tell you what is the unforgivable sin so that I can avoid it because that is certainly high on my agenda, right? But that reduces the story to that denominator without missing just the fearful statement that it is for we humans to see the goodness of God at work around us and label it as anything other than the thing to which we should be with prayer and repentance responding. It is the property of God to always show mercy. But the Lord has left us free to dismiss his work and to consign it to whatever label of irrelevance we'd like to assign to it. Today, we realize that hell is a real place, and it is that place where we willingly go when we'd rather control our own lives than submit to the lordship of Jesus. What is the unforgivable sin? It is the persistent and deliberate rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit to redeem us sinners and bring us back into fellowship with God. And all around us, we have a world rejecting the Lordship of Jesus. Who will save us from this body of death? You know, when we think of our Savior on the cross, we sometimes wonder, why is God like this? Like, why is this what needed to happen? If God is just, why is his son up there on the cross dying? And then we take Genesis seriously. We take this passage in Mark seriously. We see the horror of God coming to his own creation and watching his creation reject his saving work, calling it the work of the evil one. And these stories of horror help us see things rightly to redeem us from what we have brought upon ourselves has cost God everything. Who will save us from this body of death? Jesus will. Through amen, through his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension and his promise to come again, Jesus has promised plenteous redemption for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Now, I was struck this week by an advertisement that I heard on the radio that reminded me that this horror is not some distant primordial story from Genesis 3, but it is still very much all around us. I was 
tuned into my favorite radio station where pundits talk endlessly about international soccer. Um, and suddenly, during a commercial break, I heard this advertisement. Are you feeling lost? Life is a journey filled with twists, turns, and moments of uncertainty. What if you could find guidance to navigate through it all? Sometimes the answers are closer than we think. Introducing California Psychics, where you can connect with gifted advisors who understand life's complexities and will guide you towards clarity and light. For one dollar a minute, California Psychics can unlock the wisdom of the universe for you. My first thought was, a dollar a minute? I've got to figure out how to monetize how much I like to talk, right? I could be a millionaire, and Zeke could hold me in the lifestyle to which I'd like to become accustomed. But my second thought was, that's horror. That's horror that people would turn to this kind of demonic preposterousness for insight and clarity and truth should remind us that the world needs to hear the gospel from us. I prayed, Lord, come quickly. Help us see how precious is the gift that you've given us. We, we know the horror of human sin. Like, I, I heard that ad, and I know uncertainty. I know perplexity. I know the twists and turns of this earthly life. But I am the church, and you are the church. And we have the only guide who is worth following, the only one who can give true clarity and true insight. We know the wisdom of the universe, and it is not an evil psychic on a hotline. It's the person of Jesus. He's the only one who can save us from this body of death. And his desire is your salvation and mine. And that person that comes to your mind when you think of your enemy in this life. His desire is that they would come into the light of Jesus. For the rest of this sermon, I want to focus on the good news. The antidote, if you will, for the horrors that we read of. And then I want to talk about what it is we're supposed to be doing with that good news. In direct response to Adam and Eve's sin, Jesus comes. He came to crush the head of the snake that seeks our doom. He came to pay the price for our sins. In his earthly life, despite the rejection he faced, he went all the way to the cross to open the way of life to all those who believe in him. And so our collect of the day, which is so perfectly placed right before that horrible reading from Genesis 3. It's true. God has not abandoned this world. I mean, is it not the miracle of miracles that Adam and Eve were not just snuffed out in that moment? Like, why on earth did God let them continue to dwell? But instead, he clothed them with skins. He gave them the tools to survive in a now hostile world. And he promised even then that redemption was coming. And so in that collect, God, you have so ordered the world towards peace. And it's peace that only you can bring. And so no matter what wars erupt and what darkness seems to rule over human life, God's providence is going to be revealed on that day as having brought all of us, all of us who give our lives to Christ, to our perfect and proper end, which is that beatific vision, that, that, that pouring into the Trinity for all time. And because that is true, the colic prays, those of us in Christ can serve him with quiet confidence and godly peace. That's the good news that is yours and the good news that is mine. What is it that we're supposed to do with it? I think that's what Paul is talking about in today's lesson from his second letter to the Corinthians. 
Last week, we read the verses that come right before this passage. And in it, Paul was talking about how we as believers can live in a world so deeply impacted by the fall, full of folks who reject the good news of Jesus. And in that world, again, this is just before what we read today in chapter 4, Paul says, we are afflicted. Some of you probably feel that even today. We are afflicted, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not despairing. We are persecuted, and yet we are not forsaken. And the reason for our fortitude in the face of the world's brokenness is that Christ died for us. He died for us so that we might live forever with him. And with the faith like that guiding our way and that kind of hope urging us forward, Paul turns to what he says in today's gospel. Because all of those things are true. We are the ones who speak. We speak. We do not stay silent about the gift that is ours. We speak truth in a world full of lies. We speak redemption in a world full of sin. We speak repentance to a world searching everywhere for things that will make their lives make sense. As Paul puts it at the beginning of verse 13, God has given you and me a spirit of faith, and as we believe, so we speak. We tell the truth to any who will listen to it. We speak for the sake of the world, so that, as Paul puts it in verse 13, grace might be extended to more and more people, and thanksgiving for what God has done for us in Christ might increase all the more. And as we speak, and as we see others receiving grace, this is the truth. All of the momentary afflictions of this world are seen to be what they are. They are just momentary. For what is coming is an eternal weight of glory beyond anything that we could have ever asked for or imagined. All the horror of the fall, all the pain of the world's rejection of its Savior, it will all be seen on the last day to be replaced by the incredible, unimaginable glory of God. Amen? Amen. So most of you know that I've got a plane to catch in just a few hours. I'm off to Egypt for the first ever assembly of the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans. Um, in case you think I'm going on vacation, it will be 102 degrees in the desert with no air conditioning um, for 10 hours a day in a room full of smelling people. So um, pray for me as I head out the door. I will be one of those smelly people, I'm sure. Um, I'm thankful for Mimi for holding down the fort in my absence. I'm thankful to the incredible staff of this church and the way that they lead this church so well. I'm thankful for all of you who do the work of the gospel in this place. I mean, are we a church where everyone pulls the oar God places in their hands? We are, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm especially thankful for the Vacation Bible School that's about to start tomorrow with 70 screaming children running around here. Pray that the gospel might take root in those children's lives, and he would be working in the volunteers and through them. But I'm sad to be missing all of that. Some of you might be wondering, why am I going to the desert in the middle of the summertime? Well, you can imagine, if you will, the Anglican communion as a big table. And at the head of that table sits the Archbishop of Canterbury. And in every chair around that table is seated an Archbishop who represents in his person some former British colony. There's a seat for Uganda and a seat for Nigeria and a seat for Un the United States that the Episcopal Church fills, a seat for Australia. You know the, the history. All the places the colonies were spread, the Anglican Church was planted. When biblical faithfulness, unfaithfulness arose at that table from archbishops representing England and the United States and other places in the West, 
Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury just shrugged his shoulders and says, I, I can't do anything about it. Well, somebody is starting to do something about it. And what happens in Egypt this week is a Reformation moment that will be in the history books. You are witnessing and you're a part of the building of a new table. This is the first formal, get, formal gathering of a newly restored and reset communion in the world. And at the head of that table will not be some guy from a shrinking church in Britain who shrugs his shoulders and refuses to hold true to the faith delivered once for all to the saints, but rather it will be a rotating archbishop from some branch in the communion that's faithful and growing. And if you want to sit at this new table, you have to agree to a covenant to remain faithful to God's word. This is a true reset of the third largest church in the world. And I'm excited to be in the room when it happens. I'm happy to be there representing you in that place and representing the Anglican Church of North America in this moment that feels truly like a fresh Reformation experience. I'm also excited to be going because this new moment of reformation in God's church reminds us that God is not done with you and he is not done with me. He is not done with his church. By his divine providence, he continues to reform us and keep our eyes focused on the truth of his word and the power of his plenteous redemption. He continues to call us not to be people of fear or compromise with the spirit of this age, but people of quiet confidence and godly peace and bold speech. And while the world around us embraces sin and rejects the gospel, sometimes even when we see people in the church doing that, right? We do not lose heart. We will continue to speak the truth. We'll continue to trust the Lord's redemption for those who repent and turn to him. The world needs you and me to have that sense of quiet confidence and godly peace and to hear the gospel proclaimed from our lips and in our lives. Because we are the ones who speak. Because Jesus has given us the words of life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to um, take a point of privilege and ask uh, Father Allen and Deacon Leah to come say a prayer for me as I head out the door to catch a flight. Um, so if you will join them in prayer, I'd appreciate it. Father, we give you thanks for this momentous and historic opportunity to draw your church together in greater unity, uh, whose voice is intended to be heard as one voice, the voice of the Father around the world. We give you thanks as well for each uh, delegate, each primate, um, each bishop who will be attending this conference. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that each of these attenders would be filled with not only grace and mm -hmm. compassion, but uh, huge doses of discernment mm -hmm. and wisdom and cooperation. Our beautiful and trying God, we praise you and thank you for Andrew Rowell. We thank you for his leadership among us and his friendship among us. Lord, we lift him up and ask you to surround him with holy angels, also Bishop Alex, as they travel to Egypt, and we ask you to bring them back safely to us. We lift up Mimi and Evan and Seek we ask you to surround their home this week and wherever they go with your angels of protection. And Lord, pour out your grace on them as well. And Lord, we look with great expectation for what Father Andrew will tell us when he returns. We thank you again and praise you for the good work you do among us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I bless you, Andrew, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with an outpouring uh, of the voice of the Spirit in you. 
a heart that cooperates with all that the Spirit intends to do in and through you. May you relax in Him. Hear from Him. We pray all these things in the name of our Christ and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Amen. And would you say with me the words of faith that we proclaim using the words of the Nicene Creed? 